These are 2024 cutting edge longevity updates about the following NMN, l taurine Ashwagandha and Stress, Customization to your vitamin D dose, Niacin, B complex, B12, Glucosamine and Chondroitin, how these supplements affect your aging, and key modification in aging defense protocol over the age of 65 that I provide to my parents. Nothing here is a medical advice nor personal recommendation. So taurine, it has been a standout in 2023, mainly due to one very good study that actually compiled many other studies. And what I think was so special about this study, that first, it tracked longevity of many, many mice. And third, it tracked longevity parameters in a different types of animals, so it could uh, see the gradual evolutionary impact on aging. And it could actually identify a direct link on the impact of aging. So definitely, uh, taurine, in my opinion, uh, has a very strong protection against aging in every level. Also, I found other studies to corroborate the data of this study. So the results are very exciting. And the price of taurine is even more exciting because it suggests that a lot of people can reduce aging for a low cost. Taurine is very exciting and taurine is very cheap, uh, super cheap as well. Now, here is my perspective as of 2024. So first, taurine definitely offers protection against aging. Regarding the dose, we have seen more benefits as we go up in the dose. And currently, my perception about the dose is the rule of thumb is around one gram for every decade. So I'm 37, so I can take about three, four grams. Somebody at age uh, 80 may be going to benefit the most around seven to eight grams. Also remember that we produce less as we age. So it's not just we need more protection against aging, but we also produce less. So the need for taurine goes up. Now let's speak about the main issue that I haven't quite figured about taurine, which is it also acts as a neurotransmitters, also affect our sleep, our mood, our energy, and also the, the chemistry in our nervous system. Now, human beings, we have the most developed nervous system on, on this planet. So we need to be a bit careful on things that we take that affect this system. Now, this is something that I haven't quite figured. I've done some research into that. It would seem that taurine affects differently different people. Most people actually see increase of energy uh, on tau taurine, which is very interesting. I noticed it for me, it helps me to sleep, but for whatever reason, I woke up during the night. So I tried to, to time it uh, to see the exact issue, but it's not completely obvious to me what happens with um, neurotransmitters. So this is why I think we still need to be conservative here. One way to reduce that effect is actually taking taurine with food because taurine works more in the nervous system when you take it on empty stomach. So there could be a trade-off. It could be a compromise that we have to do to, to not uh, compromise the side effects of the neurotransmitters. It could be that we going to benefit both from the aging protection and the neurotransmitter effect. Uh, it could be a situation like this, such as many people indicate that they're going to feel better, more energy. Now, what is my approach for now? I experiment between two to four grams per day, either divided uh, throughout the day or at once. Currently, my best protocol is actually to take it afternoon because it's going to help me with a nap and then maybe going to give me more relaxation and effect for the evening if I want to be more productive instead of maybe in my situation, having a boost of energy in the middle of the night for, for, for reasons that I do not fully understand. It's very uh, individual. And also another issue is to cycle taurine. Just to avoid a, a constant uh, impact of the neurotransmitters, maybe to, to cycle taurine could be a very good idea. Maybe take a break from it one to two days on and off. For my father is 70, I provide five grams per day in powder form, uncycled. To avoid runaway aging at his age, is much more dangerous than affecting his neurotransmitters. The older we, we are, the, the more risk, quote unquote, we can take based on the studies, because the risk of runaway aging is, is tremendous after age 65. And we want to avoid that. About the brands, I prefer the powder, no fillers, half the price. Why not? I buy from now Foods. I, I love this company. Uh, so if I'm not sure about the company, then I usually buy from them for various reasons. Now, the second supplement I want to touch is niacin. First, I'm more and more certain it's an excellent NAD booster. The main downside it has versus NMN, first of all, is the flush effect. Second, there is the issue that NMN targets the muscles better. So I think it's better for 
reducing NAD deficiency in the muscles, although there are studies showing that niacin does that as well. But I think just what makes uh, an amen better than niacin is just specifically the muscles. But I more and more believe that niacin is, um, if it's divided, I think we need to divide it to give, uh, to not be dependent on the recycling of NAD. So I think the, the older we are, we, the more we want to divide. We want to, to give a bit of NAD throughout the day. Uh, this is more and more my thinking based on the research and also experiments I've done. I'm pretty positive that it's it's probably uh, the, the right direction. Nesting can also be used to reduce cardiovascular disease. It's one of the only things, drugs or supplements that reduces uh, both APOB and also uh, LP little a. Uh, basically no drug that I know, hardly any drug reduces LP little a. And niacin can do that, but you have to do take a high doses for that day. So it's a different protocol. I want to separate the NAD boosting and the niacin reducing cardiovascular disease risk. And also we are lacking studies on that as well. The one thing I want to say that I no longer take more than 50 milligrams of niacin in one dose. Minimal flush, minimal inflammation. It's a good idea also to take one day off niacin in a week just to uh, cycle the response to possibly sh uh, sugar or insulin. Taking 50 milligrams reduces the flush pretty dramatically. So I think that it's kind of solved the, the issue with the side effect. I don't think there is any need to take any dose of more than 50 milligrams. If you've been following my channel, you know that I've never fully endorsed NMN, but always kept an open mind. I always said, I need more data. The jury is still out. I said that over and over since 2019. Today, we are in 2024, and there is still very little data on NMN. In fact, NMN, how it's absorbed, how it's metabolized is not clearly understood. Not to me, but to the entire scientific community. Now, what do we know certainly about NMN in 2024? First, we know that the ITP organization uh, conducted a study with NR. And NR is very similar to NMN, and NR did not extend the lifespan of mice, meaning it did not provide cancer protection to the mice, because this is really uh, what they measure in those studies with mice. They have much more cancer there than us. This is not good for aging from the promising of uh, extra life from the perspective of NMN. Also, there hasn't been a single solid study showing that NMN increases lifespan. You have to remember that in the five years that we have data. Also, there have been about nine human studies showing muscular benefits and exercise performance enhancements, especially over age 60, 65, especially as you get, get old. This actually corresponds very well with the metabolic understanding that NMN targets the muscles very well, much better than niacin. In addition, uh, Sinclair's observation in his lab, he showed that mice basically achieve the same exact results, better muscle performance as the mice aged. These animals' capacity for exercise improved dramatically. In fact, the old mice treated with NMN had up to 80% greater exercise capacity compared with the untreated old mice. Now, I don't buy all the unpublished observations from Dr. C uh, David Sinclair's lab. You have to remember that. But this time, I think what he has found, it corresponds well with the other data. And also with even with anecdotal stories suggesting that people over age 60, they feel better physically on NMN. So I think to me, NMN improves uh, physical performance, uh, covers NAD deficiency in the muscles over age 60. And if you feel this uh, fits your situation, it's perfect supplement for you. But I wouldn't expect it to make us live much longer. If you achieve result with a supplement, with NMN, something that improves the quality of your life, of your happiness, even if it won't necessarily going to make you live longer, then this is what you want. There is nothing that could argue with that. You have to remember that. So follow the results that you achieve. Another thing that you need to know about NMN, you have to take one gram uh, per day. You should not go, go, go less than that. If you want to take only 250, then I, I would prefer low dose and uh, divided. And it's also going to be much, much cheaper. Peter Atia takes ashwagandha. Should you too? This optional and not mandatory role of ashwagandha in our longevity routine has to do with its ability to control cortisol. Let me explain. Cortisol is a stress hormone that it actually increases longevity because of its anti-inflammatory properties. Reducing inflammation increases longevity. 
However, if cortisol is too high for too long, such as during chronic stress, overworking yourself in your job, overexercising, and chronic sleep deprivation, it will kill you faster. Elevated cortisol will dismantle your muscle mass too, converting your muscle into sugar. This is, by the way, why mice on chronic sleep deprivation develop diabetes. So the key here is to get cortisol, but to cycle it and to not have it chronically elevated. Cortisol, also worth noting, is not a happiness hormone, making you worried, aggressive, and fight with your spouse for no apparent reason. It's pro-longevity and pro-divorce hormone. So how do you reduce it when you want? Besides having a balanced lifestyle, couples therapy, and all the things you already know how to manage your stress levels, ashwagandha is the only supplement or natural compound that I have found that seems to reduce cortisol. For example, I would expect alcohol because it reduces psychological stress to also reduce uh, physiological stress. But it actually increases cortisol over a long period of time of consumption. This is not good for stress management. But ashwagandha can do it. Where does ashwagandha fit in our longevity routine? In times of chronic high stress, for example, overtraining, on days where you slept poorly, on when we do multiple days fasting. In those days, we're going to have chronic cortisol elevated. I'm still researching ashwagandha and experiment with it on my own body. For quicker updates, go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash app. Okay, so this uh, supplement that I really like because your muscles are uh, one third of your entire body and your muscles, they give you vitality, youth, they give you good health. Therefore, you want to keep your muscles young as a defense against aging. The issue with muscles is they don't handle fat very well. If you take a muscle tissue, you, you stuck fat and the muscles cannot burn the fat, then they get old and even they can become senescent cells. If, in fact, in a lab, you can make a, a muscle cell a senescent cell by stucking a palmitic acid or a saturated fat inside the muscle. Now, acetylcarnitine is going to help the muscle to burn the fat. Also, it's going to reduce the dependence on burning sugar, which increases aging damage as well. So we're going to get a double benefit for the youthfulness of our muscles. Also, I feel myself been using it for many years. Physically, my muscles are based on speed measurement compared to myself when I was in my 20s, compared to other people when we compete. I feel that I, re uh, I preserved a lot of my youthfulness of my muscles. And I think acetylcarnitine is a big part of that. Uh, now, what is the update about acetylcarnitine? I used to take one gram twice daily, and I still believe that this dose is fine. However, when L-carnitine, not acetylcarnitine, L-carnitine comes from food sources such as meat, the gut bacteria can convert it into a chemical that is called TMAO. TMAO remains a controversial subject uh, on its effect on cardiovascular health. I'm not as worried as many other people about TMO, but to be honest, we, we need to be conservative here uh, in, in those situations. Also, another reason why I'm not so worried about acetylcarnitine, when you consume carnitine in, in food, it increases something called transit time, meaning the, the length of time a food or a supplement stays in your gut. And it allows more time to the bacteria to consume it. But when you take it to the supplement form on empty stomach like you should, then I think that it reduces greatly the chances the bacteria is going to touch the, the supplement at all. So you're not going to get this TMAO uh, at all. But here is the, the, the main highlight. To be more conservative, I decided to, to drop my dose to only 500 milligrams twice a day. So I get one gram in total. Um, most of the benefits anyhow are coming from the first 500 milligrams provide the most benefits in this situation. So I think it's a, it's a good conservative approach uh, in that situation. Um, also, I may take another 500 milligrams if I do intense exercise. I take it before the intense exercise. So you, most of the days are going to be one gram in total. Some days could be 1.5 milligrams in total. Of course, any suggestion here uh, that I'm telling you is what I do personally. It's not a personal recommendation, not a medical advice. I'm not a medical doctor. So what you do, it's your responsibility. Also test things, uh, see how your body responds. Don't do things that your body tells you that are not good for you. Uh, also avoid drug medication, uh, interactions with medication that you have. I cannot give you that advice. It's not a customized advice and it's not a medical advice. Vitamin D. Yeah, this is something I, I never said and I think it's important to know that 
But I mean, D is not active per se. It has to become active by becoming a 25 uh, hydroxy vitamin D and also CASA trial, which is the active hormone of vitamin D. Now, why is that important? It's because you cannot decide on the dose based on how much you take. You have to, to test and see how much your body converts. And your body converts, and different bodies convert differently based on the genetic makeup and also with age. The older we are, we need more vitamin D because we convert less efficiently. So I think you really need to understand that you really don't take the active ingredient here and your body need to convert it. So you have to test at least maybe once a year, but at least once to see if, uh, how much your, your body uh, converts. What's your current genetic tendency toward conversion? So you have to test. I feel most people need to begin with 5,000 units a day, uh, direct sun exposure, if, if they can offset that, because this is difficult. But some people may need 10,000 or even 20 thousand based on their test. So you have to test, you have to test. Can you get toxicity? It seems not, according to studies. And it makes sense. Paleontologists' research found that our race, the human race, developed in Africa before conquering the entire planet. And in Africa, our ancestors had a very strong sunshine every day with very little clothes on. This sunshine exposure causes the body to make 25,000 units within 30 minutes to 2 hours of direct exposure. Therefore, I find it difficult to believe our body cannot handle 25,000 units per day. And studies show the same, that at some point the body manages to level the vitamin D levels in the blood. It's not a medical recommendation, but what I would do is put the 25,000 units per day at the upper range. Above that, we can expect toxicity. So the bottom line is this, take 4,000 to 5,000 units per day without worry. Then retest your vitamin levels, and if you're too low, below 40 or 50 in your blood tests, increase the dose until you find your genetic sweet spot, because everyone is affected a bit differently by the dose. What matters is the end result in the blood tests. Okay, how do B vitamins affect aging? How do they affect mortality? In 2023, I conducted in-depth research on each individual vitamin B and how it affects aging. And all these B vitamins, they all exhibit similar pattern. Adequate levels of B vitamins, they actually increase longevity. They reduce mortality. They're excellent for you. I used to take them because they increase my energy and also they reduce anxiety. It's another supplement, by the way, that supports ashwagandha to reduce uh, stress levels. However, here is the, the highlight. Excess B vitamins, almost every type of, of B vitamin, if you consume in excess, the excess dose can increase mortality. So I reduced my dose from two capsules a day to one capsule a day. I take one a day and I take it during the fasting window because, you know, you, you receive B vitamins in two sources, uh, first from vegetables and second from what the bacteria do with the vegetables, how they consume, they process the vegetables and produce B, B vitamins. So every time you consume vegetables, you receive low dose, as you should, B vitamins. This is why when you fast, it's the best time to take the B vitamins. And I noticed a clear increase in my anxiety when I uh, skipped the B vitamins. So to me, it gives me uh, more energy and reduces my anxiety. So the bottom line is uh, with B vitamins, uh, if you eat vegetables all day long, you probably don't need them. If you fast and you want to cover your side of both health, energy, vitality, and also, also aging, D don't overdose it, basically. And I take only one capsule now. And I take uh, the ones from the um, Life Extension one. They recommend the label to take twice a day. You should, you should avoid that uh, for sure. Also, I learned a bit about B vitamins, although also the B12. You should not overdose it. In fact, I think the, the sweet spot between 400 to 800, uh, you, you should not have more. It can actually increase mortality if it's too high for whatever reason. We have a little data on that, but it would seem that um, it's not good to, to have too much B12. I did not know that uh, in the past. As a longevitist, you probably engage in intense exercise, putting constant pressure on your joints. Now, since the natural repair process of your joints and the ligaments can be slow, Taking building blocks for these tissues can prevent accumulated damage over a long period of time. And glucosamine and chondroitin 
are exactly that, building blocks that help repair damage to your joints and connective tissues. More repair and no harm, a net gain for your longevity. But this is just a theory. Do we have anything in substance? I'm quoting from this 2010 study. Total mortality risk in relation to the use of less common dietary supplements. During 387,000 person a year of follow-up, only glucosamine and chondroitin were associated with total mortality. How much? The hazard ratio when persons with high intake of supplements were compared with non-users was 0.83 for glucosamine and 0.83 exactly the same for chondroitin. To explain the hazard ratio here is a measurement that helps us to analyze the risk of death, and it was reduced with the use of these supplements. How much was it reduced? The risk of death for people who consumed a lot of these supplements, high intake of this glucosamine chondroitin, had a 70% lower mortality risk. The authors of the study summarized, for most of the supplements we examined, there was no association with total mortality. The use of glucosamine and chondroitin were each associated with decreased total mortality. Each one, interesting. Now, interestingly enough, Brian Johnson's team of researchers also discovered that, reached the same conclusion, and therefore gave uh, Brian Johnson glucosamine. Brian Johnson takes glucosamine sulfate alone, in high doses, twice a day. Now, I'm not really sure why it doesn't take chondroitin, because it also uh, showed to reduce mortality, and I personally take these two supplements as well. I began taking them to cover an old injury that I had in my foot, but it would seem that they're also going to help me with my longevity as well. If you want to consume these nutrients from food, they mainly appear in bone broth. I want to speak about supplements for uh, and modifications over age 65. Now, I do know that a lot of people uh, who are my audience are over age 65. And the goal here is really avoid runaway aging. I also call it a chain reaction aging. Collapse in the, one system brings other uh, systems down and it creates a chain reaction that accelerates aging. So this age is extremely important, also has a lot of customization, more than what I can provide you now. But the upside of this, despite the, the scary aspect of that, the upside, they can do much more. You can actually slow down aging much more compared to your peers, which is good. There are a lot of things that can give you way more results than, than what you could have uh, achieved at age, let's say, 25 or 30. Now, here are three basic extras I provide to my parents who are over age 65. Again, not a personal recommendation, just what I do with my parents. Not a recommendation to you. I don't know which drugs you're taking, I don't know your situation, so don't listen to me. Now, this is what I do with my parents. First, hormonal support. As we produce fewer hormones as we age, there's no secret, we need more support. I instruct my parents to take DHEA, not DHA, but which is omega-3, DHEA cream every day. It's a pro-hormone that the body can make other hormones for, from it, especially sex hormones. And I give them to cycle it and only give them to take it uh, via skin with a cream. Do not take it as a supplement uh, because the liver is going to convert some of that into uh, estrogen. And if you're a man especially, it's not going to be so good for you. Another important aspect is you want to cycle it maybe four weeks on and one week off. I follow this cycling to not hurt the natural production of the body, to remind the body that it's not going to receive DHA all the time, so it has to continue its own production. And the second aspect with 65 plus, there is more need to protect fatty tissues from oxidation and defending the omega-3. Uh, what happens, omega-3, it's very pr uh, prone to oxidation. You need omega-3, it's going to increase your lifespan, but you also want to defend it, and your protection goes down as you age. So we want to increase the natural production and natural support of antioxidant defense system. And after age 65, we require more antioxidant support to protect our brains, eyes from oxidative damage. I showed in one of my videos, an excellent study showed that actually the antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin A, they increase mortality when we are young, but they actually increases longevity after age 70. I think this is exactly what happens. They, they provide the body the support that it lost. But I found a supplement that I think is going to give better protection to those tissues. So our goal is protect the brain, the eyes, the, the, the ears, 
we want to not lose hearing, eyesight, and, and memory. And these are fatty tissues that are easily oxidized. We want to protect those. Based on my quercetin research, actually, quercetin low doses can be very effective. It's going to penetrate the brain and it's going to give you, uh, prote also activate, increase uh, glutathione on low levels as well. So if we can combine that with other, other polyphenols that are going to increase the natural production of glutathione and increase the natural production of the antioxidant de defense system. So I found an excellent cost-effective supplement that eliminates the need for vitamin E uh, when taking omega-3. And it also protects those tissues very effectively. I give it to my parents once a day, not twice a day like it says on the label, only once a day to keep the dose low. We have to keep the dose low with fatty meal. This uh, supplement is uh, called um, Super Antioxidant by uh, now. You only take one capsule because you only want to get the 50 milligrams of quercetin with other synergetic effect. You're going to see a lot of things that are going to support the natural antioxidant defense system. This supplement is not needed uh, before age 65, in, in my opinion, unless there is a specific situation. The last note about 65 plus, this is what I do with my parents. I think over age 65, we need more protein in powder form because after age 65, about 10% of the protein you consume may not be absorbed. Uh, also, you reduce your HCL level, your ability to digest protein, especially meat, goes down. And that's, that is going to get worse as we age. So over age 75, absorption rate of protein can reduce 20, 25%. The solution is including extra collagen in, in the diet. Extra collagen is extremely beneficial here. First, it builds the soft tissues, such as uh, the ligaments and the joints. These are super important as we age. Second, it's a pre-digested protein meaning it was digested in a lab somewhere and your body received it pre-digested. You don't need your body's ability to, to digest it. And you're gonna get uh, the protein in, in the easiest way for your body to absorb. It also includes a lot of glycine, which supports the antioxidant defense system that I mentioned before. And it's not very activating of mTOR. mTOR becomes less important after age 70, by the way, it doesn't respond as well to protein. So this is, all, is also another reason why there is more value in consuming more protein after age 65, and especially after age 70. So to summarize, I would use a discount effect for protein, 10% over age 65, 20, 25% over age uh, 75, assuming that whatever protein I'm going to consume, uh, only 75% is going to be absorbed. So I provide my parents with more extra uh, collagen. So these were the updates for 2024. I hope you like them. And if you do subscribe uh, to my channel and Hopefully, stay healthy, stay young, and lots of love.